Welcome to yet another episode of Out of Band. My name is Faith. My name is Jennifer. And we are Out of Band. Today we are joined by a very special person, Thomas, who is my uh, mentor, the first person that I actually spoke to with regards to threat hunting. So really happy to have you around, Thomas. Please tell us about yourself. Awesome to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, so yes, my name is Thomas Buber. Um, I am a threat hunter currently. Um, I started my career way back um, as a systems administrator. Um, I actually graduated as a um, specialization in electronics. Um, never worked with electronics since then. Um, went into IT straight away. Um, so since that been for, a, for, I think, about 10 years. And then uh, a good friend of mine um, reached out and said, hey, look, um, there's this opportunity in the security industry and organization I work with. Um, would you be interested in going into that direction. Um, I was kind of hesitant at first because most of those organizations obviously live more centrally in the country and I'm mm -hmm. more, to the, more to the side, kind of far away. So I didn't want to do that commute, but I did uh, apply and I got that job as a SOC analyst. So um, started in the SOC, um, looking at alerts for IPS, IDS devices, firewalls, etc., And then gradually uh, moved my career into having a, a broader view into our customers' environments and, and helping them assess what's, what's happening. Um, so I was at the, at the basis, I guess, of our uh, MDR service at the organization. So we started doing that in 2016. Um, and then we've expanded on that and then split out into an actual monitoring component specific to endpoint detection and response and a threat hunting component. And since that time, I've been leading the threat hunt team. So I've been doing that for... I guess about almost uh, five, six years now. So, damn. <laughs> and just to clarify, uh, what do you mean by MDR? A managed detection and response. So okay. we, we handle the detection portion and we also do the proactive response to what we're seeing. We're just not escalating tickets or we're just not notifying our customers. We're actually taking action as well, right? So by the time a customer sees a ticket, there's already actions that have been taken to contain that potential threat, for example. Okay, so basically it's outs it's outsourcing for the customer, basically. Correct, yes. So customers typically look for um, certain expertise, obviously, right? And they, they don't necessarily have that in their own organization. So they come to an MSSP, a managed security service provider, which can provide those capabilities, that, that expertise. And so we handle that for them. Um, you can think of it as an extension to their organization. Mm -hmm. um, they just get an additional set of resources and they, that team handles that specific part um, of, their, of their needs. Fair enough. Small sidestep, because the topic that we will be discussing today is actually threat hunting, um, which is kind of an interesting topic. Um, it's a term and it's a function that we are seeing more and more in the cybersecurity industry. Um, but if you take a look at all kinds of descriptions, then it usually differs from organization to organization what kind of um, roles and responsibilities they actually uh, assign to a threat hunter. So could you maybe explain a little bit from your perspective what a threat hunter actually is and what a threat hunter actually um, does? Yes, I think there's, and again, that's my opinion, but there's two important parts when you speak about the threat hunter role. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One is that it is proactive in what that analyst does, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. We don't react to an alert that is already being generated. We don't react to something that's already identified by a platform as being malicious. Mm -hmm. That's already something that we know is bad. So we don't necessarily have to look for that anymore. Mm -hmm. So proactive is one important as aspect. Mm -hmm. the second aspect is that um, we focus on behavior mm -hmm. instead of atomic indicators. And by atomic indicators, I mean um, small pieces of information like a hash value of a, yeah. a binary or an IP address or a domain name. Again, things that might have already been identified as bad, mm -hmm. right? If you can find it on VirusTotal, right? If it's if it's a binary yeah. that's on VirusTotal and VirusTotal's AV engines have identified it as, as malicious, then again, not necessarily something we want to be looking for, right? It's identified already. We want to look for that needle in the high, haystack, basically. Yeah. The things that are not yet identified. That's so, I, I so are you saying, are you saying that there is no value in IOC hunting? Oh no! I'm <laughs> happy you asked that question. I'm actually happy you asked that question because no, 
No, mm-hmm. IOCs have value, have a mm-hmm. lot of value, actually. Mm-hmm. They have a value in the short term, in a sense that, I mean, they have value for multiple things. One, obviously, for alerting purposes, right? Yeah. If, if, if you know that's identified as bad, you're not going to discard that, right? You're going to put that in those platforms. Those platforms are going to use that internally as well to notify you about that. So mm-hmm. they're definitely valuable. They're very valuable short term for us to do a quick sweep as well. Mm -hmm. Right. If we've identified something as bad on one platform that hasn't been identified as bad on VirusTotal, for example, yet, Mm -hmm. we might take that hash. We might take that IP address. We might take that domain name and we might do a search across the organization. That's still using those IOCs. That's not necessarily behavior, Mm -hmm. but it's not a primary source when we go in and look for for bad that's not tied to an active engagement, let's say, mm-hmm. or that's not that's not something that we've identified and then want to pivot or or use to move to another um, segment of that analysis. But no, they yeah. are obviously value. It's uh, valuable. It's a, it's a question of combining the two, but yeah. we prioritize behavior because yeah. the reason why maybe that's important to, to note as well is that it's easy for an attacker to change IOCs related to their attack. Yeah. Right, they can pivot to a different command and control server. They can switch to a new domain uh, that they're exfiltrating to, for example. They can just pad a binary with mm-hmm. a null bytes and the hash changes. Mm-hmm. So, while they're very easy for detection purposes, they're very easy for an attacker to to swap and yeah. to change. Right. So, if you can focus on behavior. Mm-hmm. Um, you're making it a lot di- more difficult for an attacker to change their modus operandi, right? Yeah. If they're used to doing something yeah. in a certain way, it's very more, it's a lot more difficult for them to pivot or change that behavior to something else. Yeah. So, um, as a non threat hunter, because in this conversation, I'm the only one who's not a threat hunter, um, how do you actually perform a hunt based on uh, behavior? Because one of the most difficult things actually within cybersecurity incidents is attribution, is identifying who, for example, has uh, performed a specific attack. Um, So how do you start from that? Because uh, identifying a behavior, identifying a modus operandi usually is quite difficult actually. Right. Um, you need to have a, um, a, a framework or something to tie back to, right? You mm-hmm. have to have, I like to call it a common language, yeah. to mm-hmm. communicate with your own analysts, to communicate with your customers. And we use the MITRE ATT&CK framework for that. Yeah. Um, that MITRE ATT&CK framework basically defines tactics, techniques, um, and procedures, obviously, mm-hmm. um, of what's available and what an attacker can actually do. And they yeah. start with the initial access, yeah. on the left, and that goes all the way up from to over execution, et cetera, to exfiltration and to impact, um, destroying data, et cetera, et cetera. So we use those to build, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? A, a, set, of, a set of techniques that we want to look for. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we typically do is, unless we get requests to do searches for specific, spe- searches rather, or, or hunts for specific threat actors, yeah. um, which we can then compile a list of behaviors for, for example, tie them back to techniques and then start looking for those. Yeah. Um, we like to use specifically common use techniques that might be used by multiple threat actors. Okay. Um, it's, I think it's important to cast a wide net, unless there's a real inqui- requirement to be very threat actor specific. Mm-hmm. The focus is primarily on finding the bad, yeah, and then doing potential attribution. Right? Um, you can obviously use um, intelligence regarding what industries, for example, a threat actor is most commonly active in, to identify techniques that might mostly be used in your customers' environments because they're mm-hmm. in that particular industry as well. Um, but I feel that um, it takes a little bit of a backseat. Uh, compared to, for example, identifying the most common techniques that might be leveraged by multiple threat actors. Yeah. Um, I yeah. like to make sure we, uh, we're able to, to cast a wider net and find more and then drill down to see who it, exactly it might be potentially. To prevent basically that you're overlooking something because you're not specifically identifying or not specifically focusing on one other threat actor. Correct, yes. And there's, there's, a, there's a very real risk. I mean, there's a real risk to go too much on a tangent. But yeah. there's also a risk of, of pigeonholing yourself just a little bit yeah. too much and focusing way too much on one thing while something related or slightly different might be going on still in the environment. So I'd like to still keep an open mind there and, and make sure we cover that as well whenever we can, obviously. Fair enough. Okay. Um, sorry, I, 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 I lost my <laughs> mind. <laughs> 
um, okay, but so I, I think one of the questions that you asked um, Jennifer was with regards to how do you go, how do you do the hunting? Yes. So taking it back to an IOC um, as a hunter, you would basically look at what does that IOC do, right? So, for example, is it opening? Is, is, is it download? Is it doing some downloads? As in, if you look even in Virus Total, you can see the behaviors that are associated with that particular hash or IP. And from there, you can pivot. So, yes, pivot. If, if, if that would be our initial intelligence that we receive, sometimes nothing more is available, right? Sometimes our IR team, for example, has done an engagement and we get that specific piece of information. Nothing more is in there. We'll do a sweep in the environments for our customers and we find it, for example, yes. Due to the nature of the platforms that we use, we use endpoint detection and response platforms as our primary log source, not going to say our, our only, but a primary log source, we do get insight into that behavior, right? Those mm -hmm. platforms, they render a process tree. They give us the full set of activity that that particular hash executed within their environment on that endpoint. So we get full visibility at that point into what exactly is happening. Yeah. And those that gives us key pieces of information to then expand to other parts of, of that particular endpoint to see, oh, right, so it dropped the file there and now we can search for that particular file and that file was then used in a certain way as well. And then mm -hmm. we can build that whole story uh, based on that as well, yes. Um, question, so a second a second misconception. So right now you've, uh, you've spoken about endpoint uh, hunting. I, there's also network hunting mm -hmm. what what what's your opinion how do the two like marry each other is there value in also network hunting and is it realistic given the current threat landscape i will say that from a hunting perspective any log source you can get your hands on is a valuable resource as a threat mm -hmm. hunter yeah um, there's endpoint detection and response platforms. They obviously give you a rich set of telemetry regarding the endpoint, but there's proxy logs as well, right? Mm -hmm. There's firewall logs as well. There's um, PCAPs, there's, there's um, NetFlow, etc. There's a lot of additional log sources that you can use for additional context or as an additional, uh, to initially identify specific mm -hmm. um, suspicious behavior, right? Not necessarily malicious, but suspicious because yeah. nothing detects on it yet. So yes, I would say, Hunting on, on, on the network level, for example, by looking at outliers in terms of, of network traffic, for example, is, is valid hunting, yes. Mm -hmm. But it is important to keep in mind that you want to be able to expand that capability to the endpoint as well, because it ultimately yeah. starts from somewhere. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So only being able to identify one part of it, it's, it's, you need to be able to tell the full story before yeah. you can appro appropriately remediate as well. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe somewhat of a simplistic and silly question, but considering the fact that threat hunting is relatively new and also considering the fact that everyone gives a different meaning to it, what do you actually think is the very clear distinction between a threat hunter and a SOC analyst? I would say when you're threat hunting, you're proactive. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're taking intelligence, you're taking certain pieces of information, yeah. and you're going into environments and looking if that is actually dead. Yeah. You're trying to prove a hypothesis, right? You're, you're saying, I think X is happening in the environment mm -hmm. based on this particular intelligence. Now I'm going to go in and prove it and see if that's true. Yeah. Yeah. A SOC analyst typically uses or um, his or her primary trigger is an alert. Yeah. yeah. They typically work with platforms that notify them of something that's happening, yep. and then they'll go in and do the analysis as well. Um, but it's the starting point of those two teams that kind of differs just a little bit. Yeah. Um, but as I noted initially, um, through my career path, we work closely together with SOC analysts and monitoring teams, right? They are valuable resources for us as well to give us intelligence about what's going on yep. in, in the yeah. environments. Yeah. So uh, j just to, you know, to add to that, so the, the threat hunter will not really see an mm -hmm. alert, right? It's, it's the SOC analyst that normally yeah. will monitor the systems and see an alert. Hunters, we just say, hey, we assume breach basically, mm -hmm. right? And we're like, okay, let's go and validate whether or not 
this actor is there or this particular tool is being used or this particular action has been conducted in our environment. And sometimes we can get something, sometimes we cannot get something. So over to you, Thomas. (laughs) <laughs> the results of threat hunting, please. Uh, I was going to add one thing to that. Is that there's, a, there's a feedback loop that happens there as well. The outcome of a hunt should always be a new set of detections you can add to one or more yeah. platforms. Mm-hmm. And that then obviously moves something that we proactively searched for once. Mm-hmm. Something can be reactively handled or even, even prevented, obviously, in some cases as well. But it, it obviously will tie back to the monitoring team at that point and they can take it take it on from, from that point. So um, having to do the same hunt twice in an environment is not necessarily a, a good thing, I would say. Um, you, you probably want to have a set of detections the first time you did that hunt yeah. that expands your detection capabilities for the platform to mm-hmm. make sure you can focus on other things the next time you look for something similar. Fair yeah. enough. So maybe... Uh, sorry, Faith, do you want to continue on this topic? or? Yeah, just, just a small one. Um, I remember, because we're recording this again, uh, th- there was something that you mentioned, uh, Thomas, uh, previously uh, with regards to remembering your threat hunts. So, for example, using, uh, using yes. tools like mind maps, ETC. Yeah. Uh, could yes. you please expound on that? Yes, that's a good point. So what we typically do for our hunts is we, we use mind maps. And there's, a, there's, there's two reasons why we use them. Um, one, it's because it's a very, very good visual aid to convey to our customers as we deliver our hunt reports to explain how broad we went and what we looked for, yeah. all the different techniques we focused on and, and how broad that actually went. Um, secondly, it helps our team to stay aligned for what, what we look for, for a mm-hmm. particular, with a particular hunt, right? If one of our hunters executes that hunt for one customer, we would like to have our other hunters to at least do that in a similar way and cover the same basis. They might tweak it just a little to adjust, obviously, to the environment, but we want to be at the same level, ex- executed the same way as much as we can. So mind maps have been a very good tool for us to, to do that. So we try to con- create those, especially for the more extensive hunts, as mm-hmm. much as we can, yes. Yeah. Quality so they- assurance, basically. Yeah. <laughs> And structured approach. Yeah. Correct. Structured approach is definitely a good, a good term for that. Exactly. Fair enough. Um, so maybe it will be good to explain a little bit about what a day in the life of a Fred Hunter is. And also um, maybe also to start with, how do you actually get the, um, the task of performing a hunt and yep. how that gets to it? So... I'll, I'll, ask the, I'll answer that question first, right? How do we, how do we def- this determine on... on what we need to hunt for, and how does that request come in? Um, there's, there's a couple of ways. Either we're triggered by our intelligence teams, right? Mm-hmm. We have, or we find some open source intelligence, um, or there's a new breach out there, there's new exploit out there, there's new vulnerability out there, something we found in the news. There's multiple ways that we can be triggered, that we can get that information that for us gives it some priority, yep. right? Um, log for shell, for example, um, proxy shell. Um, very, very significant exploits and vulnerabilities in the wild. We're obviously going to drop what we're doing and we're going to pivot to that in our customer environments to make sure we verify all of that uh, prior to any existing detections. We can obviously also get requests, right? Um, Mm -hmm. Sometimes customers also see something that's happening in the news and they're worried about something and they come to us and say, hey, look, um, we've seen this, but we really want you to give us some, some peace of mind um, that uh, this is not happening in our environment. Yeah. And so we will execute on that as well. Um, most importantly, in, in our case, it's a conversation with that customer. Every time we execute a new hunt, we have a meeting with that customer and we bring our information, our intelligence, they bring their requests and we come to some common ground and agreement on what the next high priority thing is that we need to focus yeah. on. It's also important to have a roadmap, right? It's not just on a hey, we're going to do this this month, next Mm -hmm. month, or next week, we're going to reconvene, and then we're going to look for the next. No, you need to have a roadmap. You can deviate from that roadmap. You can adjust where you want to, but you have to have a long-term goal and a a structured approach um, on how you want to uh, execute those. And I take it that it is uh, developed together with the client and and what their cybersecurity maturity aspirations are? 
Yes, yes. One of the big things that we like to do is we, we want to make sure that we're aware of any other teams in, in the organization that, for example, do assessments for our customers, right? And identify gaps in their environment um, that they still need to improve on to get a certain maturity level. That's kind of areas we want to focus on as well, yeah. um, because they've identified an issue, but now we can come in and we can say, well, knowing that that is not yet at the level that it should be, Let's see if we can find some techniques that typically apply to that and then hunt for those uh, and at least uh, let you know if we're seeing uh, suspicious or malicious behavior as related to that. So yeah. anything that, that tells us that there are certain gaps in customers' environments or, or missing functionality or missing maturity, we'll use that as a basis as well. Yeah, for sure. Fair enough. So um, day in the life. Yeah. Um, um it's a bit of a combination um obviously hunting is the first thing we do obviously threat hunter that's what we do mainly but it's also a combination of developing some of our own tooling Mm -hmm. um because we do support multiple platforms and so we want to have tooling in place that allows us to easily grab information from all these platforms Mm -hmm. as well so there's a bit of that as well um there's obviously um detection um creation and and specific behavioral detection creations as well for or or queries i should say right not not, not Mm -hmm. detections necessarily sometimes you just want to have a query capability um to cast that wide net so there's development for that as well we have our own internal uh repository of those those things um and then there's there's lab management um one of the things that we do is we run obviously our own exploits we run um anything that we can get our hands on to explicitly see how those things behave in all the different platforms that we support. Mm -hmm. One platform might represent it in a certain way. Another platform might give you slightly other details. And for us, it's important to kind of see the combination of all of those. Knowing how one platform is a little bit more detailed and some other platform shows you a little bit more in another area, you can combine those. And you can you can have more solid um, um, query capabilities or detection yep. capabilities based on that. So it's a combination of all those tasks basically. Um, and uh, the team has certain interests, and we like to make sure that all our individuals can focus on those tasks that they enjoy the most. Mm-hmm. But obviously, hunting is is the primary goal. Obviously, right? So anything is going to be with that in in the back of our minds. It, it has to be supportive of that of that end goal. Yeah. So. Um on that let's talk about burnout how do you ensure that your people are okay especially like right now right we're recording in a very weird time where things are happening we have a cyber war right now and everyone everywhere is saying you know you need to focus on this and you need to focus on that and you need to focus on this but the (laughs) your hunters are just people yeah, they're people. So how do we make sure that their mental health is good? First of all, I think an open culture is one of the most important, Mm -hmm. right? You need to make sure that people feel comfortable to reaching out to their peers, but also their leadership um, to make sure that they they aren't worried or scared to bring up these issues, right? It's, I mean, um, that's the first barrier they need to need to be able to get past and we need to take that, bar- that barrier away that's the first thing secondly what i try to do and again this is personal perspective obviously is like i said i want to make sure that hunters have the ability to refocus to another task at regular intervals so they don't keep like i'm not gonna say zoning out but doing the same task can be very stressful yeah. and so having giving them the ability to work on something they enjoy like they have an interest in that helps them develop on an, another topic, another level, like lab management or, or developing things or even documentation writing. Some people actually do have. Um, um, I enjoy it. I enjoy it as well. <laughs> Some people really like to write documentation. And yeah. I want to make sure that people have the opportunity to, 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 to change that out. I mean, yeah. um, you cannot say that a threat hunter's utilization has to be all of their hours in the week needs to be hunting, hunting, hunting. That's, yeah. that's going to lead to that burnout really quickly. The second and the last thing I want to say is that people need to be able to disconnect mm-hmm. at yeah. the end of the day. Yeah. Yes, threat actors don't stop, obviously, right? They go 24-7, but that's why you have a team. Yes. That's, yeah. why, that's why you have multiple people spread across multiple geographies, potentially, that can help each other out when the time comes, right? When this, 
this this new exploit goes out into the wild when a cyber war is is ongoing yeah. people just need to be able to rely on each other and take over um, from each other as the end of the day nears for someone right and then when yeah. they come back in the morning we can help and debrief and and, and make give, get them up to speed again but yes it's important that people don't get a feeling that it's a requirement for them to continuously be there continuously be thinking about um it or security or whatever i mean there's people who do i do and i mean <laughs> i'm fully aware that of the fact that i i do um and i i always have to be very mindful yeah of the fact that i might always be there in our communication channels and yeah. talk to everyone that's online but i make it very 100 percent clear to all of my team yeah. that this is not a requirement um yeah. of 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 I mean, don't do what I do, right? Um, I mean, it, it is a somewhat of a small issue within our industry. I mean, most people that are within cybersecurity are very intrinsically interested in actually doing something good, contributing to the good. And part of that is usually also being on like 100% all the time. Yes, and that's that's a very... I mean, it's it's not bad per se, right? If that's something oh. you can handle, but I mean, it creeps up on you, right? Burnout yeah. is something that happens very slowly over over a long period of time, yeah. and it's there before you really realize it. And the symptoms are not always necessarily very explicit either, yeah. right? Um, it could just be because you're not feeling very well like you used to, but sometimes it's 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 a very strange thing that just creeps up on you, yeah. um, and it's very very hard to spot as well. Yeah, people who experience it might not necessarily experience it as I'm experiencing burnout, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, as 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 a team lead or as a manager, need to look out for certain identifiers, um, mm -hmm. and we try to do that. I mean, um, but first and foremost is is making sure that people don't end up in that state, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so having a culture and making sure people are, um, for lack of a better term, set up for success. I mean, I think that's just equally important to make sure they have um, their mental health is 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 in in perfect shape. So yeah, I I, I tend to I tend to ignore the ones who come online if they are not supposed to be online. That's you good. Know, they're, they're, they're those people who are always on, and I'm like, you know what, just go away because as a leader, you will you will always you know you'll want someone to help you with something right as in to do something and you can end up uh you can end up misusing or abusing that yeah. um and that would lead them to a burnout so as leaders we should also just take a step back and remember hey they're yeah. not supposed to be here i just yes. push back i i literally push back i literally say you're not supposed to be online right now get off your machine yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's, good. that's very good. <laughs> we we need to send one to Thomas when he's online. <laughs> we need to set up some automation there. Yeah, like I said, I'm 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 really, I I'm not gonna claim that I'm perfect in that respect. Yeah. Um, I have a very hard time switching off. I'm continuously, like you said, engaged in that. What's going on? What's going on? It's honestly, it's a little bit of of FOMO. There's a little yeah. bit of fear of missing out on what's happening, right? There's so many things. There's threat intel on one hand. There's being aware of what's happening in the IT industry and the security industry. But on the other hand, there's all these new tools, all these new things, all these new ways that a threat actor can actually exploit something. Yeah. It's information overload. And um, you need to also be very aware of it's it's okay not to know everything. Yeah. You can breathe and other people can pick up other things. <laughs> Yes, it's okay to not be knowledgeable about everything that's out there. At this point, security is, is so widespread and it's so intrinsic to every single aspect of our lives at this point yeah. that it's you need to start looking at some key areas you're interested in and let the rest be, rest be handled by someone else. Yeah. I mean, there's SCADA, there's, there's industrial control secure, system security, right? Um, automation security, car security, IoT. There's so many topics and areas, just you need to find your, not gonna say niche, but your interest and, yeah. and make sure you focus on those. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I personally just have, a, I have weekends sometimes uh, that I turn off my, my, you know, my tech and I'm like, I'm offline, <laughs> like completely well, offline. <laughs> I would say one of the, one of the most, most important things I've experienced is have a hobby or an interest that does not have anything to do with IT or security. 
Oh, that's hard. Um, so you, <laughs> is it is hard. Possible? <laughs> it is. It is hard. But I mean, there's 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 a few things that I do that I don't need a computer for, that I don't need yeah. my mobile phone for either. Either, and then I I love like going out on the weekends, yeah. and doing going for a walk, etc. I mean, it's it's a simple thing, obviously, right? But it does help you clear your mind just a little bit. So. Yeah. yeah, true. Okay, let's transition to another controversial question. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> Faith likes putting you on hot spots, right? Which is good. Which is good. Um, is mm. threat hunting an entry level job? Uh, what is your take on that? Okay. No, I would say no. Mm-hmm. I would say no, and I'll explain why. Um, there's, there's a like I said, we focus on endpoint detection and response platform. We focus on behavior on endpoint devices, mm-hmm. workstation servers, etc. To be able to be effective in analyzing that behavior, you need to have some experience about how those platforms work under the hood, right? Uh, You have to kind of know what is, at some level, what is benign, um, what is expected. You're not always gonna be able to do that, but at some level, you obviously need to be able to know how that platform works. So I would say there is a transition path. There is a career path that leads up to threat hunting. Um, I think you definitely need to have um, um, a set of basic skills in the uh, that every security um, um, role should have, right? Some familiarity with 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 the IT security and um, yeah. um, industry as a whole. I would say, um, what we typically find is that um, our our MDR monitoring, so our monitoring team that actually works on endpoint detection response platforms, that actually analyzes these alerts and then the behavior, obviously, on the endpoints on a daily basis. Over time, they do acquire the skills that are necessary for mm-hmm. hunting later on. And those typically join our team from a junior role perspective. Yep. And they can obviously um, add to their experience and we can help train them uh, to become more proficient hunters. But they start off from, from an alert monitoring perspective. They get that initial trigger. They know what to look for and what they need to be focusing on. And their, their investigation can be narrowly scoped. Right, and that yeah. helps them to grow in that role. Um, there's also a bit of a requirement in terms of analysis capabilities. There's a bit of a da- data science aspect to it, mm-hmm. right? Whereas from a, a monitoring perspective or an, a SOC analyst role, you uh, tend to be working with maybe a smaller set of data, yeah. just yeah. tied to the alert yeah. that you're looking. Um, from a hunting perspective, you're looking at large amounts of data potentially. And it's a bit of a skill set. There's a skill set required um, from a data science perspective to know how to weed through that data, yeah. how to how to um, reorganize that data to, to see key key pieces of information, to find key, key pieces of information like outliers, etc. Um, that is also quite important. So yeah. I do think that um, having that as a skill um, mm-hmm. is something you need to have, and maybe learn obviously over time as well. Yeah. But, Typically, that's not something that's out of there. When someone graduates, for example, or someone decides to go from a um, non-IT job that they're in right now to, hey, I'm going to start doing IT security, um, I wouldn't say threat hunting is is the first role you would be jumping into as a result of that. But having having said that, sorry, sorry, Jennifer, having said that, so so, so that Thomas is not dragged for it, it is still possible if you have the opportunity to go for it, just go for it. It's just that the curve is a bit steep. Is steep. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. I mean, we definitely, I mean, we, we do it the way we do it because of the access to that team that does monitoring, right? And we yeah. see really rapidly um, improving their skill set. But if someone applies for a position, like if we post a new position or a role for a threat hunter and someone applies for that, then obviously, if they if they if they can showcase a certain acumen for for mm-hmm. a particular set of anal- analysis skills, then obviously that's a role that's going to pique our interest as well. Yeah, um, yeah. So yeah, if there's if there's things certain gaps that need to be filled, but other things are already there, other skills are already there, we will still decide that that is something that we can we can um, that's a a role or a person who can potentially succeed over time yeah. as well. 
Jennifer, you wanted to say something before? Yeah, I just wanted to highlight that I actually genuinely love that you emphasized on the fact that there is also a big part of data science skills required for this specific role, because um, traditionally cybersecurity and data science have been very much separated as two, two, two different worlds. Uh, but in the last few years, we actually saw that data science with the amount of data that has been, been, been accumulating within cybersecurity is actually starting to get a bigger uh, role, bigger part of, of, of uh, cybersecurity skill sets. You see it in, for example, SOC analysts with the new uh, SIM tooling, you see it with the cloud environments, and especially also here with, with uh, the threat hunting part. So I genuinely love that you emphasize that here. Yeah, and I think it's, it's a key skill at this yeah. point. Um, and to be very honest, um, and I mean, people might be watching and they might be saying, hey, but we don't necessarily have all the required tooling for this. You can be very data science driven with an Excel spreadsheet. I was just about to say that. that we're Excel. I'm controversial here. People might think I'm controversial. No. But um, we have hunters on our team that use different tools. Yeah. Um, we, we are, in, our, our mo interest is find the bad. Yeah. I don't really care how you how find you do it. We have yeah. some tools obviously that we recommend and we have some workflows obviously that we, 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 we present to our team and say, hey, look, this is this is proven to be very effective in the past. But if someone wants to use a Jupyter Notebook, for example, and write something themselves, that then obviously helps the rest of the team as well. Or they just want to ingest a CSV file from the firewall they got into an, into an Excel spreadsheet and do yeah. some, some data mangling there. I think those are just equally valid in my opinion. Um, yeah. And if you don't have access to certain tools, there's other tools that might might be suitable for the for the job as well. So yeah. never discount those, I would say. Yeah. Uh, and I think here it's important to, to note that a, th a threat hunting role is you, you need to be very creative, as in you need to give your hunters room for creativity. It's not yes. like, a, and, and this is one of the distinctions also with the sock role, um, because the sock role is more of like, you know, performance. You, you need to just perform. I don't in, know. A in a traditional sock, yes. In a, yeah, in a traditional way. I don't know a good term to, to say it, but, um, but threat hunting, you need to give them that creativity so that they can go and think outside of the box, uh, not just following a run book or something. So that's um, that's important. And that's that's also why we, I mean, we we spoke about the mind maps. Those mind maps are not set in stone. Yeah, those are an ever evolving tool that we use. And whenever someone creates a first version of that, it's exactly that. It is a first version. Someone might actually execute that hunt and uncover certain things we didn't be we weren't aware of initially yeah. and so we need to update and sometimes people find something that they, they, they run into a problem they use a certain platform to get data but they're running into an issue I, I can't get that information easily and so they write something they write a small tool that helps them yeah. that then goes obviously into the the assets that the rest of the team uses and makes everyone life everyone's life obviously a little bit easier but yes there needs to be room for those things to happen otherwise yeah. it's it's you, you can't really say this is how we'll do it and we'll never change that ever again and yeah. that is actually also something interesting because basically what you're saying is you can't perform your job a hundred percent all of the time there needs to be leeway for other activities so that you can actually feed back that uh, creativity back into your main activities because what you see usually is that um there is a function and there's a role description for that. And based on that, you need to perform that 100% of the time. There is no room for side activities. There is no room for other type of uh, involvements. You just need to focus 100% of the time on that. But if your job is dependent on creativity, on new insights, on thinking outside of the box, then that is something that you cannot do 100% of the time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think I touched on that slightly yeah. earlier on as well. Yeah. If people have an interest in tool development, for example, if they have an interest in, in lab setups and, and yeah. lab testing, I think there needs to be room for, for each person in the team to be able to pivot to that. It's yeah. always going to have some connection to the hunting part Which of the role, sense. obviously, Absolutely. right? Because yeah. it has to add value. But yes, it's a shift in the mindset at that point, and they can focus and refocus on something else uh, that might be a little bit more... Um, um, challenging, I guess, as well yeah. for them at that point. So yeah, I 100% agree. Um, there needs to be room for that. And for threat hunting, that's very important.
Yeah. So just to summarize, because we've we've mentioned now a couple of skills that are required or uh, preferred if you want to pivot into threat hunting. Uh, creativity, uh, curiosity, um, being able to think outside of the box, perhaps maybe also a little bit of interest in psychology because of the fact that you need to think a little bit like an adversary. I think you're, you're hitting on something really interesting there. Um, I, I, from experience, mm -hmm. I found that, I'm not going to say the better performing, but there's a certain skill set in with some of the roles of some of the individuals in my mm -hmm. team that stands out from the rest uh, when that individual has some experience with offensive aspects of IT security. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be from an actual actual career perspective, but even from a training perspective, right? Yeah. There is courses out there, there's trainings out there, um, like um, uh, OSCP, for example, right? Mm -hmm. Which actually trains you to um, break into yeah. endpoints and go through an environment, make sure you get uh, admin privileges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think if you have those skills, it contributes significantly to how you approach hunting. Yeah. Yeah. Knowing how to, to actually execute um, that kind of an offensive um, skill set helps you to identify or know what to potentially look for. And even like having to break into an endpoint, for example, right? Hack into an endpoint. There's certain creativity required there as well. Yeah. And so that kind of creativity then translates back into creative ways of finding that behavior yeah. in an environment too. So I do think that um, even though we're on the defensive side mm -hmm. of the IT security perspective uh, spectrum, um, there's a, there's a there's a very good use for having an offensive skill set as well. Yeah. Um, and like I said, it doesn't have to be from a career path, right? You can you can be very very interested in CTFs like capture the flag events as well. There's a lot of free capture the flag um, um, endeavors out there um, yeah. that you can that you can leverage. Um, I would definitely recommend anyone that has an interest in hunting and an interest in IT interest in IT security as a whole to leverage those. Yeah. And they start from very basic examples and very basic skills, and they grow up to very complex skills. Um, leverage those make use of those um, because they contribute quite significantly. Okay. Um, before we move from the skills, um, just one question with regards to coding. Mm. Is that a requirement for a threat hunter? No, N um, no. Okay. You can be an effective threat. Like I said, data science is more important, right? Being mm. able to know how to go through the data is more important. Uh, there's ample tools out there already that do some of the heavy lifting for you. So I wouldn't say it's a real requirement to be able to be an effective threat hunter. Do we have threat hunters who know the code? Yes. And does that, does that bring a very valuable skill set? Yes. yes. But it's not a requirement. Yeah. Uh, we have, I think, two or three key individuals in our team mm -hmm. that are really heavy on the coding side. And you'll notice that in their, in their analysis as well. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the kind of a role that grabs Jupyter Notebooks to yeah. interact with the platforms and get the data into that specific tool and then do the data science part of it and do the analysis of it there, more from a coding Python-like perspective. Yeah. But that does not necessarily mean they're better or more yeah. skilled than someone who does it with another tool, who, who runs it, who, who puts it into an Elk stack, for example, or puts it in an Excel spreadsheet, for example. It's different approaches yeah. and there's value for the coding part because they can contribute some tools to the team to facilitate and make life easier, but no, not a requirement. And what about threat intelligence knowledge? Like, yeah. Um, I think you need to be aware of what's out there, but threat intelligence gathering, sanitizing intelligence to bring it to a state that it's usable for other teams, that is a very, very specific competence. Mm -hmm. And you, you really need a team that focuses on that and really triggers the threat hunting team and says, hey, you might want to look at this because mm -hmm. we have indicators that this is going to be important, right? We, we're so focused on looking for the bad that it's very, very hard to, on top of that, as a threat hunting team, right? Not as an organization, but as a threat mm -hmm. hunting team to also do all the threat intelligence gathering and weeding through all of that. That's a separate skill set. Yeah. And I think 
it showcases the importance of having a collaborative spirit and effort going on within your organization at the IT security level as well, right? I, I do have a small question on that, sure. because you, of course, work for a large organization where you have the benefit and the luxury of actually having a relatively large team with dedicated specialists. How would you advise a smaller organization to actually approach this? Because you have separated skills, separated teams. Uh, most smaller organizations that are trying to pivot into this realm don't have the luxury of having dedicated people for that. Right. And that's where um, an MSSP might provide um, some, some assistance. Um, it's just, you first obviously have to identify which skills you have and you don't yeah. have. Identify the gaps, right? Unless you know what, what you're trying to solve mm -hmm. uh, and what key roles you're missing, um, you, you won't be very effective in, in solving yeah. that issue. Once you've identified those, you can then look at, well, um, I'm, I'm going to focus on X, right? My teams have a certain skill set. I'm able to effectively execute on this part of the equation, um, but I'll need to extend that team with intelligence. Yeah, and yeah. then maybe you can look at, at, at an organization that actually provides that type of a service that can feed your internal team of threat hunters, for example, or analysts with yeah. valuable intelligence that they can, they can use for their workflow and their their day-to-day -day, uh, um, work. Okay. Uh -huh. So how, how, how does one get into it, into threat hunting? Um, I, I honestly can only say how I got into it and how I saw most of my team um, mm -hmm. transition into it. In, in most cases, the people on my team and myself including, we went through the SOC analyst role. Yeah. Um, because it also requires some analysis capabilities, right? You're, yeah. you're, new, you're getting an alert. You're not always going to be familiar with that, what that alert is. Sometimes you'll have to do some, some, some investigation and understanding of what, what it's about. Um, but that analysis skill that you learn there and the overall um, uh, experience you gather from an IT perspective, security perspective, is, is beneficial, obviously, for the threat hunter role. So yeah. most of the people that I've seen, they've transitioned through that and then ended up as a threat hunter. Um, a second aspect that I could say is people who were on the offensive side, mm -hmm. right? Who do have a, a skill set on how to break into endpoints and devices and and um, hack their way into an organization. Mm -hmm. They obviously have the skill set to know what, how to execute on those, so yeah. they obviously know what to look for as well. Um, so those would be a, 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 a second type of role I would see very be be very effective in. in Makes that. sense. Yeah. Role. And for those that are already there, like myself and you and others, how can we ensure that we excel in the role? Always be willing to keep learning. Mm -hmm. Is is what I mean, and that, that that actually applies for a lot of roles in the IT security industry, obviously. Oh yes. <laughs> um, but for example, we explicitly don't focus on one single platform or one single mm -hmm. log source. Be willing, don't, don't come into the role with the, with the mentality that I'm only interested in platform X and platform Y or platform X is better than platform Y. Yes, that might be the case, but you need to be able to be effective on all of those. Yeah. Yeah. We work with a customer base, right? And that customer base might've made certain decisions in the past that ended up with certain infrastructure. We need to be able to be open-minded and willing to hunt through that, um, even if it might come with certain frustrations, maybe. But you need to be open there. You need to be continuously willing to learn new platforms, new skill sets, et cetera, um, yeah. to be effective. Um, like I said, there's new techniques. I mean, there's new ways for threat actors to um, execute their attacks every single day, right? There's new new exploits, new vulnerabilities that, that come to light. We need to... We need to keep pace with that obviously yeah. right? you need to stay abreast of that as well so yeah always be willing to learn um and uh and and make sure that you're on you, you stay on, on uh you, you you stay on track with that maybe yeah i would say yeah. and 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 okay so with um improving your skills um there are a couple of recommendations that you have um uh, could you so I think my first important, I mean, I know certifications in the IT industry, or the IT security industry, I should say, are, are heavily focused on. Um, I would say, again, from experience, when we hire from our, for our teams, it's not a primary concern of mine that the person has like 
10 different SANS acronyms uh, behind, uh, <laughs> behind the name. Not going to say that fa- they're not valuable, right? If a person has that, they have a certain skill set, I'm definitely going to take into, them into account. Not saying that they're, they're, um, when, when we don't look at those. But are they a requirement? No, we, we, we set up our, in, our interviews and our, our, um, our, our conversations in such a way that we, 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 we evaluate that person on, on, on their skills mm-hmm. as well in a different, uh, different way. Um, there's multiple free trainings out there as well. Yes. Right? There's, there's, there's a lot of good. There's re- if you're interested in reverse engineering, there's reverse engineering courses out there that are free. Mm-hmm. There's, 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 there's a lot of them out there. A lot of... And I'm happy to say a lot of um, IT security people are very willing to share their skill sets. It's, it's, it's an open community and yes. everyone just wants to, to contribute to it. Yeah. A lot of people out there are very willing to share um, yeah. what they have learned and even go as far as set up courses that are freely available for everyone. I would definitely say make use of those, yeah. right? Find those and, and, and go through those. And if you're willing, obviously, um, or you have an organization that's willing to pay for certifications, obviously take those into account as well. Yeah. If you have absolutely no experience with the IT security industry, I would say um, CEH, for example, Certified Ethical Hacker, yeah. is the entry <gasps> level. Say that. <laughs> It is a base certificate. It is a base certificate. It's a base certificate, and it gives you a bit of an, a, a landscape overview of what's yeah. uh, what's out there from an IT security perspective. Um, I think if you need you need to start somewhere, yeah. right? Yeah. And I do believe, even though I know I said in the past and, and, and like a little bit a while ago that right now it's hard to know everything uh, about everything, right? Yeah. It's so widespread. You do have to have a bit of a, a global overview yeah. of the IT security landscape right yeah. before you go and and find your niche yeah uh, so i think you need to kind of find something that that uh, facilitates that so i think that's a suitable um, certification if you want to pursue that i'm already um, happy that you're not mentioning CISP as, as the foundational broad oversight <laughs> i mean i don't want to be controversial <laughs> and is it is, is what is what is taught in that in that in that certification valuable i think i mean it's interesting for sure right mm-hmm. you you have an extremely broad view at that point yeah. But is it is it something that you would? I mean, it's a very very heavy course as well, right? It's yeah, it is. You you you. I don't want people to. I would say people first need to dip their toes into the IT security industry. Yes. It's a bit of an easier certificate to understand if it is something for them or not. Correct. I feel that if they immediately dive into CISP, for example, they that run they screaming away. <laughs> Yes, they might be scrambling and saying, this is not for me. And honestly, that is not the IT security industry either. Yeah. I think if at a later date you're interested in, in pursuing that, I say go for that. That's, that's good. But definitely make sure your, your first like, experience with the IT security industry is via something that's maybe a little less, less challenging, potentially. Yeah. Baby steps, right? Yes. Baby yeah, steps. exactly. What are your thoughts on the Security Plus? Uh, do you do you know whether it is as in if if you compare Security Plus with um uh, with the CEH, is it the same or is it um, not? Like, really, no, no. Don't have really an opinion on that to be honest. Okay. Um, I would say it all depends on if you have a certain budget you'll have to do some research initially before you dive in and shell out that money, right? Yeah. So I would definitely say that compare, compare the course um, um, content um, and the syllabus may be a little bit between each other. Yeah. Um, there's, there's multiple entry level kind of certifications out there, but it's all gonna depend on your budget. Uh, and we're obviously maybe talking to people or have an audience that, that, that aren't yet in the IT industry and are just looking to do something on their own. Right. So at that point, budget is obviously going to be very important if they're not, if it's not something that's going to be paid for by their organization. So I'd like to keep an open mind there. Um, Like I said, a lot of free, free content available out there as well. Like I would definitely start with that as well before you think it's worth to invest your, your hard earned money into, into this as well. So there's, there's definitely a gradual path that you can follow um, to be very honest. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm cautious about the time, Yes, b- but I think it's important for us to do a shameless plug. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So t- 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 tell us, Thomas, uh, what happened within 
the last month. But in the last month, mm -hmm. we're talking CTF, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so every every year for the past four years, um, like I said, I'm I'm very uh, um, I think CTFs are very important, right? Yeah. Because they they teach you certain skills. Um, and I've been I, I don't have a lot of time to play CTFs anymore, but I do focus on one each year, which is around the Christmas period, end of the yeah. year which is um, the Sans Holy Hack Challenge. So again, from the perspective of providing free content and free training material, um, Sans and uh, Ed Scout as his team, um, they've been setting up what, what's called Kringlecom, which is mm -hmm. a um, um, free uh, virtual conference around IT security. And it always comes with a CTF called Holiday Hack Challenge. And I've been doing that for the, the past four years. And um, this time around, I won first place. Um, <laughs> it's awesome. So the idea is basically you, you create, you, you go through the challenges, you solve all of them, you write your write-up, again, from the spirit of contributing to the community and having something out there that can help other players to go through the challenges as well, because they stay up for three years. Um, and so they pick out some of the top um, um, write-ups that got submitted there. And so I was lucky enough that mine was considered for first place. So very happy yes. about that. Congrats. Congratulations. And yeah. I must attest that it is a really, really good write-up. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> I will say it's it's like I said, um, like a week or two ago, we were facing a certain problem. And mm -hmm. I knew I saw something similar with one of the challenges this year in, in, in the holiday hack challenge. And I actually looked back at my own <laughs> write -up, you know, what the actual command line was that I needed to execute. So it's already showing value for me. But yes, we build these things and at least I write these to improve my technical writing skills, that's first. But secondly, to make sure that I have something to contribute back to the community as well. Yeah. So that's yeah. my my yearly way of, of making sure um, I do my part. Yeah. Very admirable, absolutely, yeah. And, and as I said, uh, I think in one comment, Log4j did not stop you, right? <laughs> no, 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 that, that no, I, I, I uh, persevered and I, I pushed through regardless. I, I, at that point, I was so far, I was so far into it, I was like, I can't back away now. So I'll just, <laughs> I'll put that on top. I have a few hours left in my 24 hour cycle. So <laughs> no, very impressive, very impressive. Jennifer, do you have anything? Um, uh, no, I, I, I think for now we are quite good. Um, I just want to thank you, Thomas, for like the, the incredible insights that you provided into threat hunting. Um, I think we might not necessarily be done yet with the topic. I for, I for myself would actually like to see maybe a little bit more of a deep dive or maybe a little bit more of a practical insights. Um, so yeah, let's maybe take that for a second time. Yeah, uh, a recommendation for the viewers do you have any yes. recommendation um if you're interested in this role in, in in being a threat hunter um definitely definitely pursue that um and you, there might be some additional work you need to go through to get to that point but it's a very rewarding job and the it security industry as a whole is a very rewarding industry from a learning perspective and a skills perspective yes. so push through for sure and hey maybe i'll speak to you from a threat hunting perspective awesome. <laughs> there you go <laughs> and with that we're done for today thank you to our viewers yes. until next time bye bye thank you. Ciao, ciao. Bye.